In 2016, uh, Latoya and I got to go to the Apartheid Museum in South Africa. And my, my brother was proposing to uh, Siba at that time in South Africa, it was such a special moment. But we, we walked in there and experiencing, experienced something magical and yet intense. And whenever we go to a place like this, uh, whether it's in South Africa or just right downtown at the, uh, the Center for, for Human Rights uh, in downtown Atlanta, we love going and finding the, the law that stated that, uh, that white people and black people couldn't be married. And we love taking a picture in front of that as an interracial couple. And for some reason, I couldn't find those pictures, but I promise we take those pictures. And uh, it's a special moment for us. And then we go find the law of when that law was revoked and we take a picture in front of that. And that the law that made it not right before God, because it was always right before God, but that made it right before man in that country. And I wanted to start here because there's a reality that there's a sickness in the human condition. Ever since the beginning pages of the Bible and with Cain and Abel, uh, rivalry and division, the disease of hatred, the disease of bitterness between people has always been there. That has divided people apart from one another. And whether it's over race, but a lot of times it's not just that, right? It's, it's over cultures or politics or even generations or of genders. And we always want to get into a place where it's us and it's them. And so today, we're going to look at what God thinks about this. And as we're continuing on in Ephesians, we're going to be talking about God's marvelous plan for unity. Amen? And it's a marvelous plan indeed at where the world separates, he unites. Or, you know, the, the old marriage line of what God has united, let no man set apart. So we're going to be in Ephesians 3 today. You can go ahead and turn with me over to Ephesians. We've been in this series in Ephesians. Uh, it's been great. Beginning of every year, we have expository preaching to really help our hearts draw near to God. Um, and then Paul is continuing in his uh, line of thought from last week. Like the second half of Ephesians 2, it's kind of just part A to this part B that we're reading. So if you want to hear the, the better version of this sermon, go, go listen to Michael and Kendall last week. That was, that was awesome. But let's pick up here in Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I have already written briefly, in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into, check this out, into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So, you know, if you didn't catch this, let's kind of just kind of unpack this a little bit this morning, all right? So Paul is kind of coming here, and he's saying there's just been this mystery that has, has not been revealed to previous generations, and that mystery, he says, is very clearly, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of togethers there, right? Kind of reminds us of our vision statement, walking the way of Jesus. It's, it's that word. It's walking the way of Jesus Together, you know it. I knew you knew it. Okay. Uh, you know, walking the way of Jesus together in his spiritual family, right? And so there's this mystery that Jews and Gentiles couldn't be one family together. Now, you might go, what do you mean that was a mystery? Uh, of course God wants all people to be saved. Of course God wants to bring in all nations and all generations. Why would that be a mystery to them? Well, if you're new to Christianity, this actually would have been a complete mystery for them. Because for the Jews, they never thought anyone else could be saved outside of those that had become Jew. 
And so what I would like to do just for a moment, uh, the first part of uh, this lesson is me kind of doing biblical nerd out on you guys, kind of going through a couple different scriptures in the timeline of uh, the Jews and Gentiles uniting, and then we'll apply it to us. Is that okay with you guys? And so uh, where did this all start? Because even if you go all the way back uh, to Genesis 15 and 16, when God gave Abraham the very first promise, the very first covenant, he said, I'm going to make you, your family is going to bless all generations or all other nations. And yet the Jews didn't really listen to that. When they got given the Torah, when they got given the law, that was all about being set apart and removing themselves from the world so that they could live with God, that they could be holy, set apart. And then they, instead of saying, this is supposed to be a light to show everybody else, they, they started going, this is a light that no one else can ever have. And so they, they got those Ten Commandments, but then they got those three major works from the law we talked about two weeks ago. That was circumcision. It was eating kosher, like not eating pork or shellfish. And then it was practicing Sabbath. And they said, hey, this is what defines us, and you aren't doing that. And so it became a giant us versus them, but it wasn't just us versus them. It was a, we're the safe people and you're not. Or not even that, it, it was, we're the only people that could ever be saved or that could ever have relationship with God. You are so much less than, you, you can't come near us or him. And so God didn't like this, right? Clearly God has this marvelous plan of unity. So what I want to do is I want to start going through a timeline of how God intentionally, with forethought and with love, brought the two groups together. So it started out with Jesus uh, oh, let me, let, me, let, me, let me say this first, because this helps paint the narrative. So at its peak, after several hundred years of what I'm saying happening, the Jews had some of these things that describe the way they viewed Gentiles. So a daily prayer for Jewish men. If we were in a synagogue 2,000 years ago, that morning all the men would have been called to pray this prayer in certain circles. That, thank God that I'm not a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. Talk about the identity statement in the morning. Hey, daily affirmation. God, I'm thankful I'm not them, right? No, like, man, this is really making me feel great about relationships. Um, today, we're not talking about the woman or the slave part, right? But we're talking about the Gentile part. So every morning, the Jewish man is thinking about how they are less than or not with me. Uh, one of the rabbis of the time said this quote, best among the, the best among the Gentiles deserve to be killed. Those uncircumcised Philistines. Those unclean people, they deserve to be killed. Now, not everyone, I'm sure, had that intense, but one of the rabbis did. Uh, then a, the Pharisees and most Jews would have never eaten with a Gentile in their entire life. Why? Because kosher rules wouldn't have allowed it. If I ate with a Gentile and they didn't eat kosher or they wanted to eat, uh, if they didn't practice Sabbath or they weren't circumcised, that would make me unclean. So my entire life, not only would I just eat with them, but then go home and thank goodness that was tough. At least I was cordial. No, no, I never would have even invited you into my home. I never would have gone into your home. It was called table fellowship. That's what Galatians 2 is all about. Um, but they never would have eaten together. So out of this, Jesus is going to bring reconciliation and unity. All right? But you kind of go, how are you going to get the people that think that, that are, it's, it's so much us and them, how are you going to unite those two groups? Let's see how intentional the Spirit of God is with this. So it starts with Jesus. Uh, you know, in Matthew 8, right after uh, the Sermon on the Mount, who's the first person that Jesus praises their faith? It's a Gentile. He, and he even says to this Gentile officer, he says, there's no one, no one has faith like him in all of Israel. And he lifts this Gentile up over everyone else. That's the first person he praises. Uh, what about the end of Jesus' life? I'm going to run through this. Uh, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, make disciples of the Jews. Whoops, no, right? Make disciples of all nations. He said, I'm trying to bring something new to all nations. Acts 1, he repeats it. The thesis statement for Acts 1, is in, uh, for the whole book of Acts, is in Acts 1.8. It's right here. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to come and empower you to be my witnesses, talking to the apostles. He says to be witnesses in Judea or Jerusalem in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, which is the Gentiles. And what you see through the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit intentionally spreading uh, the gospel out from Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria and to the Gentiles. Let's see how the Holy Spirit does this. 
In Acts 2, the gospel of Jesus reaches Jerusalem, Judea for the very first time. We know that story. The Holy Spirit comes down. It's this powerful moment. And then you, then you go and you say, well, I'm sure right after that, all, all the Jews are going to go out to all nations. And like, that doesn't happen. They don't want to share it with anybody. In fact, it's not till Acts 8 when a persecution happens that sends them all out. I'm not going to say God started the persecution, but God definitely used it to spread his gospel because he knows that people were hard-hearted about sharing the gospel with them instead of just with us. So the disciples scatter because of the persecution across Judea and Samaria, and it says they spread the word wherever they went. And then so sure enough, in Acts 8, you see the, first, the gospel reaches, of Jesus reaches Samaria for the very first time. It's a powerful moment with Simon the sorcerer and things like that. And then finally... In Acts 10, uh, actually, uh, some scholars say a couple decades after Acts 2, you finally arrive in Acts 10, where the gospel reaches the Gentiles for the very first time. And if you go and read that, it's, it's so clear, it's the Spirit that wants it. So the Spirit comes and speaks dreams and visions to Peter. Then the Spirit comes and speaks dreams and visions to Cornelius to go find Peter. So he goes and finds Peter. Then Peter comes over to Cornelius. And then uh, Peter and the Jews are like, we don't think you should deserve the gospel, but why don't we just start speaking and see what happens? They start speaking. The Holy Spirit comes down. And then Peter says this interesting phrase. He goes, who can now stand in the way of them being baptized? Why would he say that? Because people were standing in the way of the Gentiles being baptized. They didn't want it, it, The Holy Spirit had said, guys, boom, wake up, I'm here. I've been telling you this over and over and over again. Save these guys. And so they, they baptize them. And then in Acts 11, Peter goes back to the Jews in Jerusalem. And guess what the, Jews, the, the elders in Jerusalem do? Why did you baptize him? Why did you baptize the Gentiles? And literally the first half of Acts 11 is just Peter defending why he saved the Gentiles. Like, all, I mean, it's basically the whole theme of the book of Acts is the gospel reaching people that the Jews never thought should be reached. And so then, you know, in Acts 15, because uh, the, the issues had to come up of, well, fine, well, fine, we'll let the Gentiles in as long as they become Jewish. So as long as they follow those three works, right, with kosher, circumcision, and uh, Sabbath. And so the Holy Spirit and the elders, they send out this decree, and I love the wording in Acts 15. Uh, the elders and their decree out to all the disciples share, it seemed to write to us in the Holy Spirit that their decision wasn't just of man, but they were so in prayer and in fasting that it was of the spirits. To say, these Gentiles don't have to become Jews. And then finally, in uh, Galatians 2, Paul's writing, referencing that moment in Acts 15, and he says that uh, they decided with the Holy Spirit that Peter would be the apostle to the Gentile, I'm sorry, the apostle to the Jews, but then Paul would be the apostle to the Gentiles. You guys following? Yeah. You with me? Okay. And so this is how everything that God's led up through all the way through. But do you see how intentional God is about bringing the two together? What the world separates, God unites. Where the world brings hatred, God brings love. And he's willing to fight for it and to work for it. Amen? Let's go back to our passage in Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to continue in verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his spirit. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. So suddenly after all that, that takes so much more meaning. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Check this out. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may, now that we, is he, what is he referencing? He's referencing the Jews and the Gentiles, all of us, we together may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of the sufferings, my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So what we see right here is that for Paul, he clearly sees God has this plan for unity. 
And he says God is willing to fight for it. He was literally willing to suffer for it with Jesus, and I'm willing to suffer for it too. And so he shares the bookends of our passage. He talks about in verse 1 that he's a prisoner for Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. And then he also says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. He literally says, I'm in prison because of you. I'm, I'm suffering because of you. I don't know the last time someone said that to you and how that made you feel, right? But he says, no, not to shame you. Don't be discouraged. No, this is your glory. What can we learn from that? It is glorious in the body of Christ. It is glorious when we suffer for our relationships. It is glorious when I put myself to the side to love you. It is glorious when I'm willing to give my emotions, to give my time, to give late nights to being there for you and helping your soul. It is, it is glorious in the church when we suffer for one another just like Paul. Amen? Now, that is our kind of biblical little study right there. Then you might go, hey, that's a cool little information, Jordan. How does that apply to me? I'm, well, I'm glad you asked, right? And so we'll talk about us. Uh, back in uh, verse 8 and 10, he does talk about us, the church, right? He says his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. That in us, that there's something in our relationships, that when, when people go, I wonder who God is, when they see the church, they see the wisdom of God. That I wonder what God's love is all about. Is, is that real? When they see you and your relationships, they see God. They see the wisdom of God is display in us. Notice, not just in me, but in us. It takes a togetherness for this to be made known. So let's talk about us. Have you, we've all been on the Gentile side and we've all been on the, the Jewish side. Have you ever felt excluded or left out? Have you ever felt like the Gentile, like I'm pushed out? Maybe you didn't get that promotion at work again. Maybe on, on the sports team that uh, you didn't win or it, for some reason you can never make the playoffs. It stinks to be a Falcon or whatever it is. <laughs> Like that you just feel excluded, you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's a cool club, the playoffs, you know what I'm saying? The, uh, my, my dad is 6'4", every male on my dad's side of the family is over six foot. I have always felt excluded from the tall club, you know, like I don't know, I don't know what it is for you, but have you ever felt excluded or left out? And I just want to encourage you that in the body of Christ, you belong. You have a special place right here. Amen. Maybe you felt on the Jewish side, have you, is there a group that you think is less than or shouldn't belong with you and with yours? Like, hey, I'm, I'm willing to go to church and maybe sit on the same row or I'll show up to the kid's birthday party because our kids are friends, but man, I, I, I'm, hey, how's it going, man? Oh, yeah, good to see you. But I'm never going to invite you to my house. I'm, I'm not going to open up my heart and be honest about, man, how I've been feeling and what are my struggles and, and have a deep fellowship with you because I know how you think about that. I know the way that you view and your people, that there's, a, there's an automatic narrative that divides. Have you ever felt that? And you might go, well, they started, no, 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 no. We're, we're talking about how we can become and adopt this marvelous plan of unity in our own hearts. We got to go there and talk about it. Why do we do this? Why do we divide? What's that disease in us that makes us want to have division, that makes us want to form groupings of people? Have you heard this phrase, that birds of a feather flock together, right? Have you heard that? There's something so natural in us that makes us want to get close to people that are just like us. And the reality is, guys, is that church is the most segregated day of the week. That, I mean, you, the homogeneous church is out there and it's everywhere. And when you go to a church where everyone thinks the same way, votes the same way, looks the same way, was born around the same time, if I did a fifth, I would drop this. Okay, that was actually, I caught it. Anyways, what, what, a lot of problems happen. You know, uh, first of all, you start getting really narrow-minded. And maybe the way that that is seen in the most uh, visual way is with worship, right? You kind of have these worship wars. I thought this was really funny. The different ways of worship, right? Right here on the right. I don't know if you can find you. I know some of us, man, our hand, we might be singing with our whole heart, but our hands will never leave our pockets, right? We might every once in a while give a little, you know, a little flap, you know what I'm saying? Or if you're like Tom Brown, it's a bounce, you know, as he's talking, as he's singing. But 
Uh, I love the Mufasa. Can y'all see that one? Like the Mufasa, right? You know, just, all right. I, I don't know how many people here, you're full on touchdown the whole time worshiping. Maybe you're starfish, right? Just in worship. I'm more, I'm about here. Like this is me and I like, I like to, you know, do my little rock. You know what I'm saying? I like, that's kind of me. The worship team's coming up, not because they're about to sing me off, but because I, I know it's every once in a while we've been known to do that. Um, <laughs> They're not doing that. They're not doing that. But uh, guys, the reality is, if, you've, if you're new to North River, you might have noticed that, wow, some songs you really love, and then some songs you don't, that we, that we worship with together, right? And you might feel like, man, I love it when Sherwin leads the acapella song, or I love it when Chase does that contemporary song, or I love it when Josh does that gospel song, or even today, every once in a while, we might have a little country song or a little, a little opera song, right? But look, this is what we're not gonna do. Paul even talks about this. We're not gonna say, well, I follow Sherwin, or I follow Chase, or I follow Josh. No, we're all here because we follow Christ together, right? So what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna sing three choruses together, three different songs, and talk about each one in between to, to illustrate our differences in the body of Christ and how we can be united together. So why don't we all stand together? Here we go. The ground began to shake. Stay standing, stay standing. Who is contemporary, this song or contemporary worship, who is that, like that's your jam, like you love contemporary, right? That's your own thing when you're in worship on your own in your car, your quiet time. Okay, how about a different question? Who is this like, man, we're singing another one of those songs that repeats itself? Like, who is that you, you know what I'm saying? A few of us, look around. Hey, there's, but there's unity in coming together, right? Okay, let's do the next one. time they let me be on stage with them during worship, but I'm loving it. Okay, who is this? This is your, like, favorite, acapella. Like, you love acapella. That's what you come to church for. Okay, how about, okay, hands down. How about the opposite? You're like, why are we singing another dinosaur song? Like, I don't, you know, like, anybody? A couple of us, right? A couple of us. Yeah, now I said it wrong. It makes you scared to raise your hand. All right? It's good to be, it's good to be together, to unite together. Let's do one more. The Lord our God, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is 
before you fit, sit down, before you sit down, who is that man? Gospel and songs like that's your jam. You just love. What? Wow! Wow! Okay. Now let's be honest. Who is that? Like, man, we sing those kind of things too much. We only got a few of them we sing. You know, a few of us. A few of us. Okay, you can sit down. Let's give it up for the worship team. Thank you, guys. Yeah, 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 exactly. Guys, the reality is most places you go on a Sunday morning, they, they, how do most people decide their worship? It's because they find the church that sings the type of worship they like, that they're comfortable with. At North River, we actually think it's a good thing to sing songs that you're not comfortable with. Think about the Jews and Gentiles right here. The Jews would have been incredibly uncomfortable to be a united church with the Gentiles. There would have been so many things that would have been incredibly uncomfortable. They would have never eaten together in their entire lives, and then church then was literally around a meal. So they're stepping into a situation with people they've literally never done before. It's so uncomfortable. But Paul says that this is good. He says that's good for that uncomfortability. Why? Because it shows the power of Jesus making them into a new humanity. When, when we're around people in our comfort zones and we just surround ourselves with people that think like us, worship like us, talk like us, look like us, nobody, that's, nobody thinks the power's in God. A human can do that. God says, no, 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 no. My manifold wisdom is made known when all the different tribes and nations and ethnicities and cultures and thoughts come together in my church and when, and when they love each other, the whole world can see my wisdom. And when they love each other, the whole world can see it. So the question is, guys, do you come to church and build community based off convenience and comfortability or your biblical convictions in Christ? Because there's a reality that there's a lot of different churches that you can go to. And of course, like, you know, right doctrine and discipleship and mission and things like that. But there's also churches that you can just go just for convenience, just closer. Or just out of comfortability because they all kind of look like me and talk and kind of the worship and I, I think the pastor is funny and whatever. And you can find that comfortable place. Or is it based off of your convictions? And guys, I think there's a reality that at North River, we have to continually come back to this because this is how we're building church. But if we don't talk about it, then over time, you start feeling those uncomfortable things and think that's bad. I just want to state as, as one of the evangelists, we believe that uncomfortability is good. And even for those online, there, there's a reality to you. You got to ask, is the reason that you're, you're still not coming to church, is it because of con comfortability and convenience? Or is it because of your biblical convictions? Because there's something here that I can't get home by myself. When we get together with everyone, and it's not just my family group or the people that live in my neck of the woods, when there's diversity of ages and diversity of ethnicities and diversity of thoughts, that's when the whole body comes together. Is there stuff that we can't do here that you can do on a small group level? Oh my gosh, yes. There's so much you can do on a small group level that you can't do here, but you can't have this amount of diversity come together on that small group level. Does this make sense? But again, why do churches do it? Well, it's because birds of a feather flock together. I do want to talk about this a little bit longer. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the homogeneous like, way of building churches is actually like a well-known leadership principle amongst church leaders and especially church planters. It's called the homogeneous, uh, the homogeneous unit, unit principle. It's called that. We don't do it clearly. Okay, so the, the, the homogeneous unit principle, right? And, but if you go and listen to podcasts on church leadership or read books on church leadership, literally they will talk about this. And they say, go find your target audience, as if you're a corporation. And, and, then, and then go find your target audience. And so some of the big mega churches, it's, uh, hey, uh, literally, you can go find them talking about who their target audience is. And so it's like, hey, we have picked uh, white males in their 30s and 40s that are husbands and fathers. That's who we're targeting. And everything is going to be geared for that person. 
And so whether it's the way you're greeted at the front door, the way people dress, the worship, the preaching, it's all for that one person. And the, there's this whole leadership thing out there that says that's how you build churches the fastest. And yet it's not biblical. And we have to ask, are we really looking for speed or are we looking for biblical family? And the reality is the more we look like biblical family, God will bless it daily for new growth. But it'll be his blessing and not because we're trying to control it. You know, speaking of that, um, at North River, we do not do this. We believe that the basis of unity isn't similarity. That the basis of unity is Christ. That's the basis of unity. And I just wanted to take a moment and to thank the original elders and evangelists like Ross and Bob and Tom. Because about, about 20 years ago when the church was formed, it, it was mostly uh, middle class suburban white families. And they were all about over 30. And they got together with the, the founding members that you know, are still here and decided, hey, we're going to go young and we're going to go diverse. Because that's what we see in the scriptures. And 20 years later, look around at what's happened. Look at what God has done. So I thank you guys. All of us stand on the shoulders of giants that have decided to set the path before us. You know, speak, the last thing I'll say about this homogeneous way of growing and why it's not biblical is this quote from the author Renee Padilla. And she says, it may be true that men like to become Christians without crossing racial, linguistic, and class barriers, but that is irrelevant. Check this out. Membership in the body of Christ is not a question of likes or dislikes, but a question of incorporation into the new humanity under the lordship of Christ. Whether a person likes it or not, this same act that reconciles one to God simultaneously introduces that person into a community where people find their identity in Jesus Christ rather than in race, culture, social class, or sex, and are consequently reconciled to one another. God says my way is different. And it's not based off the identities that the world gives. It's off of my identity I give you in my new family. Um, the world loves to separate, separate us in all kinds of ways, right? Back then it was Jew, Gentile. Now it's older, younger, Democrat, Republican, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, single versus married, mask versus no mask, triggered. Sorry, I'll take that one off. Um, The reality, guys, is when we went every single time we fight one another, Satan already wins. There's only one real battle that matters in the universe. 10,000 years from now, it's not going to matter who's won the battle of socioeconomic class. In 10,000 years from now, it's not going to matter who's won the battle this year in the, in the presidency. 10,000 years, it's not going to matter who's won the battle of all these differences. The only battle that matters is Jesus for Satan. It's light versus darkness. And guess what? We're on the same team. And guess what? It's the winning team because of Jesus. Well, we got to do this with him. We got to do this with him. And as soon as we start fighting one another, then that, that means Satan's already won. We have to stop fighting one another. So, man, we're going to cross out. We're going to stop fighting one another. We're going to be united and fight the real battle in this world against darkness and Satan's minions. Um, nope. Amen. So I just want to say this passage before our practicals. Paul, back in Galatians, said, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you remember that prayer every Jewish man prayed? God, thank you. Their identity statement was, thank you that I'm not a Gentile, thank you I'm not a slave, and thank you I'm not a woman. Why do you think Paul referenced these three here? He was reorienting their identity, right? To say there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, you're all one in Christ. And while we have a lot of issues at North River, while there's ways that we can grow, while there's things, there's things that we got to apologize to each other about, of course, but man, at North River, we are striving to be one in Jesus Christ. 
Let, let's uh, talk about uh, practicals, and then we'll close out. So this week, walk in the way of Jesus together. I want to encourage you to meditate on your relationships, and this will be online, and think about do you, where do you feel like you feel left out, or what do you feel like you're kind of the Jew and you're pushing people out? Meditate on that. Ask God for clarity. Search me and know me. Then invite the love and the power of Christ into that moment to bring healing, to bring reconciliation. And then thirdly, to show hospitality to someone you usually never would. So that person on the other side of the aisle, whatever that means for you, invite them, sometime these next few weeks, invite them into your home. And if somebody goes, am I the person you're supposed to invite? It's okay to say yes, but I'm probably that for you too, so I'll beat you to the punch, right? Like, and let's, let's love each other. Let's love each other. And then uh, this week, right, we're not having family group this week because we got an all-church midweek picnic this week. It's going to be a blast. When you walk in uh, the, the doors this uh, Wednesday, this is all going to be tables. And we're literally going to have a big family meal together to break our fast. It's going to be a powerful time. So we'll have a shortened service. Um, but because of that, for anyone that can stay afterwards, can you help? The tables are even over here. You see them? We're going we're gonna to have to take all the chairs out. We've never done this before at North River. We, we, for all, everyone in leadership group and board, we, 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 we made sure we crossed off all the dots for people to see it's okay to eat in here. But, but we're just going to do it on Wednesday. We're not going to normally always have food and drinks in here. It's just a special occasion. I was supposed to say that. Okay. Um, <laughs> But we're going to be good stewards and not just walk in and spill our drinks, right, all that, okay. Um, but we're going to have that, and I want to invite you, for however you've been doing the fast, I want to invite you this Wednesday, uh, if, if, the, if the Lord leads you to it, to, to fast from food from sunup to 7 p.m. If you're not there in your convictions and you just feel like you're doing it out of being forced, hey, don't worry about it. Like, no shame, like, fast in the way that you can fast. But... Uh, we want to encourage everybody that can to fast from food that day, and then 7 o'clock we'll all break our fast together right here as a fellowship and as a family. Amen? I just want to say, guys, it is an absolute privilege to be a part of this family. Thank you for everyone that has walked the footsteps before in the previous generations to lay the foundation for us to be able to do this together. Amen. God bless. Amen.